Well, good morning, Riverside. Morning. Welcome. So glad that you're here. Excited for part three. Today, we're going to be talking about losing your limits. Losing your limits. How many of you have somebody in your life that helps you uh, by reminding you of the speed limit? How many have somebody like that? You have somebody that just, yes, yes, I see that hand really high. All right, all right. You have somebody that's like, hey, I just want to remind you, it's 25 on Allegheny River Boulevard. It's 25 here, right? All right, so you have people who remind you. Uh, right now, why don't you just turn to that person next to you and say, thank you for reminding me. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for reminding me of my limits, all right? Now I want you to turn to the person on your right or your left and say, it's time to lose your limits. All right, it's time to lose your limits, all right? Now you're wondering, what am I talking about? Well, I've been reflecting on this idea of limits on this chapter for this last week, and uh, it actually remind me of a, um, right now, uh, whether you have this technology in your car or it'll be on your phone or GPS, now you are actually told what the speed limit is. If you see, it'll show you what your speed limit is where you're driving, right? This is what you should be driving, which I take that as a challenge on your GPS, which is saying, hey, 25 minutes to your destination, speed limit 45. I'm like, I'm doing the math how I can get there in 20 minutes, right? It totally helps me. Um, this is, yeah, you can pull that picture up. Um, so Holton Road Bridge, uh, on the Holton Bridge here, uh, about three months ago, maybe two months ago, I was driving across, and I, my car told me I could go 100 miles an hour on, right there, you see that? I took a picture. I was like, this is proof in case I get stopped, right? <laughs> My car says 100 miles an hour, right? I don't think that would hold up in any court, all right? But 100 miles an hour. Wouldn't that be a you know, nice little drag strip right across the Holton, Holton Bridge? But some limits are good, okay? Some limits are good. Uh, but when I think about speed, um, I also think about, um, you know, those who are hurting right now, the speed of the Hurricane Ian. 150 miles an hour winds that hit Florida. And then thinking about that, uh, it's been on our hearts. And I appreciate what Pastor David was sharing about Convoy of Hope. And I want to echo that. Um, and I want to take a moment because uh, my aunt and cousins are in Port Charlotte. And their home was hit. Lots of damage. Also, my wife has a cousin in uh, Cape Coral. We have a friend in Cape Coral who pastors a church. So we have a lot of family and friends. And I'm sure some of you you know somebody that was affected by this. So right now we're going to pause. We're going to pray for people. And as I pray, I want you to agree with this prayer and by name those people. Just call out their name, okay? Let's do that right now. God, we thank you so much for your uh, unlimited power. Lord, that you, God, want to work through this storm. Um, and you want to impact a lot of people's lives through compassion, through your church. And so we pray for every church in that area. We pray for Convoy of Hope. We pray for anyone who is affected, uh, their homes up, upended, their jobs, whatever it is, you know that your power, your glory will dis be displayed through all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Reflecting on this, the, this havoc of the hurricane, I was amazed at the amount of information and preparation we have now. Um, even before, even when it was a tropical storm, the state of Florida was getting ready, and different counties were starting their preparation, uh, their process. In fact, um, I didn't know this, but a friend I went to, uh, I went to high school with, uh, saw me post um, on his, uh, um, or I, I don't know if I posted on my aunt's page or something, but he made the connection. I had family, and he reached out to me. He said, "I can go. I'm, I'm working with emergency services. We're getting ready." Um, for the hurricane. And uh, when I thought about this and researching it, before the 1950s, ships used radios to warn the coast of incoming storms, but they didn't know exactly where they were going to hit. Now, now we are able to, minute by minute, on your phones, everybody can watch this storm and where it's going. This technology, uh, where we, have, we had limits before on how we could track a storm but now it's un almost unlimited what we can see 
and we can track these hurricanes from space. And thinking about this, I was thinking about um, our president, John F. Kennedy, late John F. Kennedy, and he pointed to the advances of technology when he envisioned Americans going where no one else had gone before. There's a great speech that's called, We Choose to Go to the Moon in 1961. And I'm going to share a, a segment of this speech because you will see in there, as he's casting vision for going to the moon, he identifies limits, okay? All right, so this is what he says. This is just a segment. He's at Rice University on the football field. He says, we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not been invented capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, controls, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return to safety to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that of the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today. He was there in Texas. And do all this and do it right and do it first before this decade is out. Then we must be bold. JFK, if you, if you start counting out there's just limit after limit he's identifying. Metals we don't have, the distance, the places we haven't gone before. That was 1961, 1969, Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon. This is a picture of Buzz Aldrin. Before Buzz Aldrin went on to the moon's surface, uh, he took communion in the lunar module, and he read from John 15, and he also read from Psalm 8. This is the two verses he read from Psalm 8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that, that you visit him? This is Aldrin, who was, <clears throat> that who was exceeding a limit that had stood since creation. No one had been on the moon. And he took time to acknowledge the unlimited power of God. He takes time. Here he's exceeded a limit that was dreamed about eight years before, and now he pauses to acknowledge the unlimited power of God. It's good for us to pause before we jump into this chapter and acknowledge what Paul's about to talk about. He's going to talk about limits. But I think to understand this idea of limits and the unlimited God, our limits and the unlimited God, it's, it's been said that understanding the fullness of God is like trying to put the Pacific Ocean into a glass of water. I think that's a pretty good picture. We cannot, in our minds, fully understand the greatness and the power of God. Consider these truths. God created the heavens and the earth in seven days. Consider this. God is three persons in one, something we still trying to wrap our minds around, just that very idea. Consider this, that through his son Jesus, God the Father became one of us in order to live a sinless life, know all that we experience, be the perfect sacrifice so that we have a way that we have a way to a relationship with him. Us, with our limited understanding, to have a relationship with the unlimited power of God. Even more than these miracles I just named, God's character is limitless. Psalm 147.5 says this, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. So well put. Mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. There's two big things uh, that come out of this scripture, but I want to actually give you four character, characteristics of the limitless power of God and who he is, his character. First, God is omniscient. This is God's understanding is infinite. We have limited understanding. We have limited knowledge Okay? Even with all the scientific advances that have happened, and uh, it's really interesting, if you listen to that whole speech by JFK, he tries, what he tries to do is take all of history, and he, 
and he, all the advances, and he says, if it was put into a 50-year window, what this would be like, like every week, things that were happening. It's fascinating. With all of that, though, all the knowledge that has been, that is happening now, more and more and more knowledge that we are creating, understanding new scientific advances, not even close to the all-knowing God. God is omnipotent. He is mighty in power. He is great and powerful. As uh, we see the power of, of Mother Nature, we see uh, the, the power um, of God. We only see glimpses of how powerful he really is. God is omnipresent. Psalm 139 is a great uh, psalm to look at as David talks about this, that he cannot get away from his presence. He talks about it in a good way, that he's always there. Jesus and the Great Commission reminds us, and I will be with you always. So God is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. And then this last one doesn't quite fit the O's here, but it's one that God just continued to push on my heart. He said, Jay, you're missing one. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. God is love. This is so huge. The God is infinitely, no, uh, infinitely powerful. Uh, he is all-knowing. He is everywhere. And yet, in the middle of all that, his character that we can't, this characteristic we cannot miss, God is love. He is love. All of this is an important baseline for our passage today, which is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It's out of the New Living Translation. You can follow along here up on the screen on your devices or on your, in your, in your uh, Bible. It says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees. And I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious riches, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And we can all say, Amen. 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 Listen, if you are in a place where you are discouraged, if you are in a place where you're wondering, is God going to show up? This is a good scripture to go to. It really is. It's an encouraging one. Um, and standing out here, a couple big things. Unlimited resources. Unlimited resources. Infinitely more. See, Paul here, and he, he, this is a prayer and a blessing. There's kind of two blessings here. Unlimited resources and infinitely more. He's pointing this, this group of people, the Ephesians, who he pastored for three and a half years, and he's sending them this letter, uh, this powerful letter, and he's saying unlimited resources and infinitely more. One of the things that really stood out, though, is how this scripture begins. When I think of all this. Now, if you look back and listen back to last week's message, He's talking about all the different, he, he starts to allude to the different, uh, the complexities of the church as it's beginning, where there are Jewish Christians, there are Gentile Christians, they're living in the Roman Empire, uh, which was a melting pot. There was all kinds of persecution that was happening. There's a lot of challenges. And so in his mind, and they believe he's writing from prison when he's writing this, he's, he is... Uh, He's saying, when I think of all of this, 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 got me, this had me uh, pondering for you. What are you thinking about? 
What is on your mind, not just at this moment, but in the last several days, in this week, in this season of your life? What is it that consumes your thoughts? What troubles you? There's things that are on our minds and on our heart. Sometimes they consume us. It's the things that trouble us, the things that keep you up at night. What are those things in your life right now? Here's the thing. God knows. We know this. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He knows exactly where you are, what's going on in your life. And remember, God is love. When I think of all this, here's the next question. With whatever it is that's consuming your mind, your heart, your emotions, how are you responding to those thoughts, those things that trouble you, that stress you out, that frustrate you? How are you responding? Here's a better word. How are you reacting? In my own journey, uh, one of the things that I've learned about myself is that there's certain things, pressures or frustrations, things that weigh when they start to weigh heavy on me. I can go one of two directions. Sometimes those, those emotions, those frustrations, they kind of they sit so heavy on my heart that I just want to uh, disengage. I want to disengage. Who likes to disengage and just like, hey, leave me alone, right? Don't talk to me. <laughs> Super helpful. <laughs> my family loves it. <laughs> like, Dad is so encouraging today. He's not talking to anybody. <laughs> but we all react in some way. How are you reacting? How are you responding to the troubles that are, that are in your life, the frustrations, the things at work, things in your family? Here's one, the things that you can't control. The things that are out of your power. What are those things? And how are you responding to them? Paul, right here in this prayer, in this, when I think of all this, what does he do? I fall to my knees and pray. I fall to my knees and pray. If you look through, uh, I've studied the book of Ephesians many times, and um, a few years ago I started to notice this theme. It's posture. Paul actually names several different postures throughout this letter. Um, he talks about being seated with Christ. When he talks eternity, he says he uses this phrase, seated with Christ. He talks about walking, your walk with Jesus, walk in love is an exact phrase. Also, he talks about, and well, this is a spoiler alert, stand your ground. And now he says, fall to my knees. Now, now, Paul is Jewish, and in the, in, in the Jewish context, much of prayer was standing. But here, this, this is humility and submission. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees. I read one commentator who said he may have been chained to a Roman soldier. Been kind of awkward for the Roman soldier when all of a sudden Paul just falls to his knees and the Roman soldier's like this. Okay? But he falls to his knees, prays. How are you responding when you think about the things that are troubling you and frustrating you? I can tell you in my own life what I've learned, one of the best things, and I wish I would remember this more often and earlier, is that I'd fall on my face and I would not, sometimes I would pray, but other times I would just put worship music on and just worship the Lord. It's much better than my other route. <laughs> so Paul has two prayer bless blessings right here, a pastoral blessing for the people he loves and he's concerned for. These two big uh, prayers that he prays, they really highlight limits. And I want to talk about, just for the next few minutes, how do we lose our limits? There's three big ones here that come out of this scripture. 
First is to lose the limits of your power, of your own strength. Uh, three times he talks about power, and twice the word is dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. Okay, that's the Greek word dunamis. So he's talking about explosive power of the Holy Spirit, which is available to you, and when you come into a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit dwells in your, in your life. Comes in, the Spirit of the living God comes into your life. That's in Romans chapter 8. This power is available to you. God does not want you to live life on your own strength. He does not ask you to do that. He wants to give us power. When I think about power, <clears throat> I think about uh, something that happened a few, let's see, what, when was this, six weeks ago, something like that? Um, it was a Sunday morning, and uh, maybe you remember a, a, a thunderstorm we had here on a Sunday morning about six weeks ago, lots of lightning. Anybody remember that one? Lots of, okay, a few people, all right. Um, well, um, I just remember I wanted to sleep a few more minutes. How many, how many are with me? I was like, I'm going to sleep. Uh, this this uh, alarm can go away. Um, and I dismissed my alarm, and I'm just trying to sleep. And growing up in the Midwest, um, thunderstorms, I was talking about this with somebody a couple weeks ago that was from the Midwest, and it's like, the thunderstorm thing, it's not like, yeah, it happened all the time, so when it happens, I can just sleep right through it. Um, and uh, I remember waking up to the sound of my wife screaming at the top of her lungs, and it was, it was like, whoa, what just happened? And I ran out, and my wife, I said, what happened? What happened? She said, lightning just struck right behind our house. I was like, that's it? <laughs> that's what I got up for. And she's like, it just happened. It was right here. It was almost on our house. I was like, okay, all right. Well, I needed to get up anyway. Well, um, we came home, and my wife was like, hey, we, we, need to, we need to look around and see if there was damage in the, and look what happened behind our shed. That's where it struck. And then, um, uh, and, and I'll show you a picture in just a second. Don't put it up yet. Um, so then uh, later that night, I go down to my basement to my, my study, and I go to turn the light on, and the light doesn't turn on. I was like, oh, man, I must have tripped a breaker with that lightning strike. And then I look down, and there's pieces of something all over. And so what happened was, we'll show this picture. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side is the fence post that it struck that fence post, and then it traveled through the ground, and we had an electric uh, dog fence. Um, and it traveled through the electric dog fence right into my home. And that is a surge protector, which did its job, but paid the price because it exploded all over my basement floor. Um, and um, we are very, very thankful um, uh, because little metal pieces went into the rug, burned through the rug, but uh, no fire. Uh, so, so many things to be thankful for. Uh, my family was contemplating. We also had a few things damaged, lights, and then a deep freeze. So we got a new deep freeze, and, but we got a stand-up one, and instead of being in the, in the basement, I decided, hey, we should get one for the garage. It's right there next to the kitchen. And my family was reflecting, and somebody said... I'm so thankful that lightning struck our house so that we could have a freezer in the garage and that we don't have to drive all the way. I said, yes, that is one of the things we can be thankful for. <laughs> this is that and our house didn't burn down. One of those two is really big. Uh, <laughs> but I had an electrician come from, uh, from Riverside come and, um, you know, fix, fix the, uh, the breaker. And we were talking, and I said... Uh, I said, how many, like, hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity traveled through this? And he said, thousands. He said, try millions. And I looked it up. It's like 300 million yeah. volts of electricity traveled probably through that little dog fence that is no more. Um, <laughs> my dog doesn't realize it, but he could go for a long way. So. <laughs> we just put a collar on him, and we pretend, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> 
Really, I was like, I don't think I want another current into my home. Uh, so, but this is this is what had me thinking about power and strength. You know, the power of God. Um, and because because I, I even I was praying, I was like, God, what do you want? You know, what was it that you wanted me to realize? And maybe one of the things, along with thankfulness, was just this idea of like being aware of the power of God. Being a little more aware, that word millions, millions. He has so much more power than we have. And yet we choose so many times to try to do life on our own. In our own strength. And the creator of the universe is back here saying, anytime I can step in. Anytime you want me to, I will step in because I don't want you to do this alone. This was a thought that I had. We can be a conductor, a conductor of the power of God in our life. That means he is traveling, his current is traveling through us, or we can be an insulator. We can be an insulator. We can be the ones that insulate our lives from the power of God and try to do things on our own. The power of God won't be dis displayed in us, we might be able to impress people with how busy we are and how many things we can do, but it's much more of a witness if we can be a conductor of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. That's what Paul is calling his, his church to do. He's saying there is unlimited resources unlimited fall to your knees acknowledge the power of god and say god i can't do this without you i cannot do this without you lose the limits of your power the second thing is lose the limits of your understanding you know in this passage there's two things of understanding here uh, the understanding of god's strength and the understanding of love and i want to focus on the love piece you know and i I think uh, this one was really heavy through the whole week, this idea of understanding, losing the limits of our understanding of God's love. Because I think there's in here, or maybe you're watching online, I think this might be the biggest struggle. Understanding how much God really, really loves you. Um, Paul, he puts this so well. And this is a good thing for you to keep this passage, whether you can, and um, early in my uh, faith, I always wanted to keep my Bible really nice, but I realized, hey, it's good for me to highlight, circle, underline. Now I just go to town on it. And I encourage you, this verse especially, I think it's good and it's worth repeating. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide how long, how high, and how deep his love is. So I contemplated this phrase, and there's many commentators give all kinds of different things about this, this uh, passage. Here's the things that I thought of. You know, Paul was very um, knowledgeable with the scriptures. So in t at times, he's echoing the Old Testament. And I think, I wonder, just wonder, just out of curiosity, is he thinking of some of these other scriptures? Psalm 108, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. How high, how high, how high does his love go? It never stops. It's infinite, infinite. When I think of, uh, there's a scripture about uh, the, the forgiving us from the east to the west. How much, how far does his, his grace extend to, for you like this? Jesus says, I love you this much. As he stretched his hands out on the cross. How wide. And the one that really got to me, Psalm 40, verse 2. You, lift me, you lifted me up out of the miry clay. You, you pulled me up from the pit of despair. When I look at that, how deep his love is, listen to me. I don't know if you're in a pit of despair right now, and maybe you're in a pit of your own making. We've all been there. You dug a hole so deep. You've made mistakes, and you find yourself deep. 
the love of God will go all the way to find you. He will go deep to go down and to get you. He is searching for ways to find you, to rescue, stretching his arm down to say, I will lift you up out of this. Even if it's, even if it's your own fault and your own doing. It's so important. And I think, I think maybe here in this room, I think about, you know, the struggle that we have to receive the love of God. And maybe that's you. To really receive God's love. Maybe there's insecurities in your life. Maybe there's past hurts. Someone has hurt you. And because of that, the idea of someone loving you is too hard for you to step into. Maybe you have a struggle to believe that God would accept you as you are, just as you are. It's a beautiful hymn, Just As I Am. That's exactly how God takes you. He'll work the rest out. You struggle with the idea that maybe you've exceeded your limits of mistakes. You've listed them out. You think, God's done with me. He can't love me. Pastor Jay, you have no idea what I've done. God knows, and he loves you. The same as he loves me and everyone else here. He loves you. It's time to receive that love and let him in. And let, him have, let him have full access. You are putting up walls and barriers of people in your life because you have been hurt, because you don't trust, because whatever that is. And right now, God wants you to know he loves you. Whatever you have done, whatever you've been through, however you've been hurt, he's saying, I stretch my arms out to you because I love you and I want a relationship with you. The last one is to lose the limits of your ask. You see, this verse 20 is a powerful one for me because I have a, a, a verse of the year every year. And a few years ago, Ephesians 3.20 was my verse. This, this is such a powerful one. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Ponder that just for a moment. Whatever you can come up with for your ask, God's like, I could do more. Your ask has a limit. This last week, um, I talked about my friend from high school, and he reached out and he said, hey, if you want me to, I can try to go check on your aunt after the, the storm. I said, oh, man, that'd be, that'd be great, no pressure. And, and I said, hey, how about you? How can I be praying for you? He said, well, you know, I don't know what my, my house is going to be like, but most likely it's going to be underwater. You know, just location, where the storm's going to hit. I, I mean, I've been told we're all going to be underwater. And I said, I said, Rick, this is my prayer for you. I said, and I, I messaged this to him and prayed for this for two days, just off and on, just praying. I said, Rick, I'm praying that your house would have no water in it so you'll have more time to go help other people. And during the storm, he was giving updates, and he was like, hey, I've, I've heard it's pretty bad over there. I'm, I'm pretty sure my house is underwater. I was like, man. I was like, I'm still going to pray. And then he'd get the update, and he goes around his house. And he's like, this is, this is where water usually gets up to when it rains. And then he gets up right up about five feet from his house, and the water stopped right here. And I was like, that's awesome. And, and I was thankful just in that moment, and my mind was on this passage. So I was, I was thinking, when you pray, attach so that to your prayer. Because all through scripture, it's like this. That there's prayers, and Paul uses this little phrase, so that, so that. So that God's glory, so that you can help others, so that you can testify. The limits to our prayer are often 
it's very me focused because we live in a me world, which is God, can you just get me out of this? Sometimes we have a prayer like that. We've all been there. God, can you make the pain stop? That's our prayer. God, what do you want to teach me in this storm before it ends? God, how can I bless others during this season and after this season? Think bigger. Ask bigger. And do it all for the glory of God. Point to others and point to God's glory with your prayers. Listen, I promise you, you'll see something different. You'll see things that'll just blow your mind and it will encourage you, well, I should probably pray just a little bit bigger now because God will show up in ways that you're like, wow, yes. Better asks and bigger asks. It's your faith. God wants you to grow in your faith, that your roots grow down deeper and you would bloom and, man, as he prunes you back, that God would do bigger things through you. Lose the limits of your ask. As we close, I want to just read, read back one little verse from this. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. God just brought me back to this line for this close because this uh, make his home is one word in the Greek, which is to dwell, means to dwell. But it means to dwell permanently. There is a very, it's dwell permanently. And we're going to pray, and, and I want to pray for you in just a moment for whatever the limits are in your life. But the most important thing right now is if you're here today and Christ has not come to dwell permanently in your heart, listen, Jesus is not interested in an Airbnb. He's not interested in an overnight stay. He is interested in taking residence in your life through eternity. Amen. That's what he's interested in. That's right. So, the invitation is here this morning. His love stretches to the heavens for you and he invites you into relationship with him. It's up to you to take this step and say, all right, I'm ready. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love, which we only, we don't fully understand it. But what we do understand is that you went to the cross for each and every one of us. You paid for our sins, which for all of us in this room have a long list. But we're thankful for your grace, for your love that made a way for us. If you're here today and you have drifted in your relationship with God, or maybe you don't have one yet, today is a day that you can step into a relationship with him. And so, I want you to just agree with this prayer. If that's you, say, Jesus, I am welcoming you into my heart to dwell permanently in my life in every aspect. May your power, may your love take residence in me from this moment forward. Forgive me of my sins. Make yourself at home. If that's you, just stretch up your hand and say, I made that commitment right now. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, yes, yes. And if you're here today and you're struggling you're in a pit. You're in a season of despair. And you just need somebody to pray for you right now. Just say, that's me. Just stretch up your hand. And I'm going to pray right now. God, you know every hand and every heart, the people who are struggling, who need the power of the Holy Spirit to come on them in a big way. Lord, I pray that your presence would be known in them this week. In Jesus' name, amen.